if you take a little bit of insulin and you put it in a nasal spray and you spray it up your nose, it's well, a way of treating Alzheimer's. It's also a really potent cognitive enhancer. So why is it when I raise insulin, my brain works better? Yeah. Yeah. So I have to speculate a little bit, Dave, okay. just because I want to, um, and I want everyone listening to know if whenever, whenever I mention I'm speculating, it's because I, I don't know of a specific study that I can rely on to answer. So what I suspect is happening is that with the intranasal administration, you're able to get that insulin absorbed directly through that upper kind of wall of that nasal cavity. It, so this is insulin is not getting systemic. Right. Um, in other words, it's not getting into general circulation. You are just kind of shooting it right up to the brain, especially the hypothalamus, mm -hmm. which is, you know, right in that lower part or just above that nasal cavity. And it could be, now I'm, I'm theorizing, it could be that as the insulin perfuses directly up through that layer, the epithelium of the nasal cavity and up, it just directly opens the doors and allows a rush of glucose to come in. It would be my speculation. Yeah. Um, now, it wouldn't be contributing to the elevated insulin-induced insulin resistance, again, because if I had you on a table and I was measuring your blood insulin levels mm -hmm. systemically, like from a, your, your arm um, vein, um, we wouldn't get any, it would be no, no change. There's no change in insulin at the level of the entire body. There's no systemic um, alteration. This was such a modest and such a direct yeah. administration. I suspect it's just moving right up into the hypothalamus, opening the doors, because some of, in, uh, of the brain's glucose uptake is dependent on GLUT4, which is an insulin, itself an insulin-dependent glucose transporter, whereas other parts of the brain, including in the hypothalamus, it has um, other, other doors, other glucose transporters that are just always open. The moment glucose goes up in the blood, it will flow into that cell, whatever the cell may be, the kidney or the liver. But then parts of the body, including the hypothalamus, will have some of these insulin-dependent doorways where insulin has to come and knock. Now the door opens and glucose comes in. So it could just be that you are just bypassing any systemic circulation mm -hmm. and going right to the brain saying, hey, brain, I want you to open those doors and really pull in a bunch of glucose. That makes good sense to me. And I've always been a fan of having exogenous ketones present and doing a little bit of nasal insulin. So I'm like, all right, neurons, you've got your ketones, glial cells, you've got your glucose, let's go. And that is a pretty darn good state of high performance. I just don't know how often it would be safe to do it, which is why yeah, I, I don't yeah. do it very yeah, often. Yeah, I don't either. I, okay. I would, because too much insulin will cause insulin resistance, uh -huh. I do think that'd be one reason I'd say to use it judiciously. Like, like once a week, uh, kind of. Yeah, pr yeah pr oh yeah, that'd be, I think, perfectly yeah. fine. Um, but then second, there would be, there's another part of me that just thinks, well, is, is, that, is that epithelium, that layer of the nasal cavity, it's not natural for it to see insulin. Would there be some long-term effect? Am I stimulating too much growth? Am I going to make mm. the epithelium start to get a little thicker? I, this is, of course, entirely speculative. Oh, yeah. But if it's like on the order of once a week, like you're saying, that would have, that's such a modest bolus, such a modest frequency that that wouldn't have any of these effects, I'm confident. With regards to symptoms, if you have just been told you have high blood pressure, insulin resistance is the most common cause of what's just yes. called idiopathic or just run-of-the-mill insulin resistant, uh, of, of run-of-the-mill hypertension. So if you have hypertension, that's definitely a knock in favor, a check in favor of you having insulin resistance, high blood pressure, most common manifestation. If you have a family member with type two diabetes, you're on that spectrum as well. Very likely, you're much more likely to have insulin resistance. And maybe the final one of the symptoms before mentioning some clinical tests is, is the skin itself, where there are two um, distinct skin manifestations that are a direct result of insulin resistance. One is called acanthosis nigricans. Then the other one is skin tags. Right. Skin tags is a little more obvious where it's just like a teeny little like mushroom stalk. Like it's not a big rounded mole. It's a teeny little bump. People are probably thinking of it correctly um, right now. You can imagine there's these just almost like a little mushroom of skin mm -hmm. and you tend to get them around the neck. You can also get them around the armpit. Usually anywhere where there's going to be a skin fold or a wrinkling or crinkling of skin, you can see these skin tags. 
And then the more complicated term I just mentioned, acanthosis nigricans, that's also at those same locations, like the, around the collar of the neck, um, where we all have a little bit of a skin fold, and then around armpits and groin, etc. The skin can get a little darker, and now depending on pigment, of skin pigment, that may be easier or harder to see, the natural pigment of the person, but the skin will also start to have a texture and appearance of like crinkled tissue paper. So if we took a tissue paper, crumpled it up, and then opened it back up, that's kind of how the skin might look. So this darker crinkled skin and skin tags, that is proof positive of insulin resistance. And then just if wow. anyone's wondering, that's also imminently reversible. As the insulin resistance goes away, the skin resolves in that regard. So skin is kind of a, a window to the metabolic soul in that regard.